Today marks our last installment in the parables. Uh, we're going to be just kind of putting a nice bow, kind of a bittersweet bow, honestly, but we're going to put a bow on it nonetheless in our study through Matthew chapter 13. And so we've been on this journey now for quite some time, uh, not quite as long as we were in 2 Corinthians, praise the Lord, uh, but uh, we have been uh, going through the parables nonetheless. So Richard, you can go to the next slide. We're going to do a little review, just a quick recap. I'm not even going to do like the full recap I always do. We're just going to boom, 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 get through this uh, because this is a lot of good content. Uh, we are all caught up uh, online with all of the sermons that have gone into the series. So if you've missed one or you want some of the sparks and idea, you can go back and uh, check us out online through our website or other means. So our first week, we learned that God works through ordinary means to reveal his extraordinary purpose. We were first starting with the big question, why parables? What's the purpose behind Jesus talking in stories to people when he could just shoot it to him straight? Uh, and this is why, because uh, he wants to use and wanted to use uh, ways for people to engage these kind of really big concepts and to bring it down to our level of understanding and the way that we relate to things. Kind of like how a pastor uses illustrations. Uh, Jesus did a similar thing, but he taught in stories. And so he used ordinary means to reveal really God's extraordinary purpose of the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven like? We've been exploring that uh, through the parables. And so then we started with a parable uh, from there, and we learned that God's word produces life and hearts prepared to receive it, where we learned about the sower and the soils, and that it really depended on the condition of the soil as to whether or not the seed that was sown by the farmer, because Matthew loves farming imagery, the guy who wrote uh, Matthew, and he loves just this, this agrarian sort of picture. A sower goes out to sow some seed, and it depends on the condition of that soil, whether anything's actually going to happen with that seed. Then we learned uh, through the parable of the wheat and the tares that God's justice at the end gives hope now, uh, because there was a comparison between the wheat that was good and was planted by uh, the master of the field, which was symbolic of Jesus himself, and then also the tares or the weeds that look strikingly similar to the wheat, but are really poisonous and will kill you, and they were planted by the enemy. And so Jesus gives this picture between the two types uh, of individuals who have responded to these things, and that ultimately at the end, God's going to, he's going to ex execute justice by, by what he does with those groups of people. And so then we learned uh, that God will change the world one life at a time by looking at the parable of the mustard seed, that really God likes to start small. Sometimes we think of it that God wants to start really big and extravagant and bombastic, but really God wants to start very small and really one life at a time. Uh, just by you having a changed life, by you responding to the Word of God, uh, that's going to make an incredible difference, not just in your life, but the life in, of those around you. And that will spread throughout the world. So then we learned, uh, we looked at two parables, the parable of uh, gr uh, the pearl of great price and the treasure hidden in the field. Uh, and we learned that God's kingdom will be established when we embrace its value that the kingdom of heaven was like this treasure hidden in a field and this pearl that a merchant was looking for. And it was so valuable, these things, that these men, they, they saw something in this, this object that they sold everything they had just to get it. And uh, I think that that speaks volumes to when we really understand the magnitude of the kingdom of God, that we would be so sold out to give everything that we are and have to participate in that. So then the following week, we, we looked at 
which one was this? The parable of the net. And uh, God will sort out the problem of evil for good. Uh, he uses fishing imagery in this parable uh, where uh, some people go out and the kingdom of heaven is like a net that is tossed out and it brings in this big, great catch of both good and bad fish. And in the end, the good and bad fish get sorted out. Um, and Jesus explained that one as well. And then last week, um, just to kind of wrap up the, the literal parables of things, uh, we looked at when Jesus, what did he say? I don't have it in my notes, but I have it in my Bible. Um, uh, oh, the new and old treasures, that's right, where um, the kingdom of heaven is like a scribe who's been trained for the kingdom of heaven and is like a master of the house bringing out uh, his treasure of what is new and what is old. And so that this idea between the old and the new is really uh, Jesus talking about how God, he, he reveals himself and he expresses his eternal good through both um, the old covenant and the old expectation of the kingdom, as well as what Jesus was revealing. And that all brings us to today. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And that is, the title for today's message is Closed. Ha. I love one word sermon titles, Closed. Um, this is in contrast to an earlier series where the final one in that series was open. And now we're talking about closed. And our main passage is going to be the very end of chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13, 53 through 58. And the sobering uh, big idea is that unbelief keeps us from experiencing God's kingdom. Unbelief keeps us from experiencing God's kingdom. You can go to the next slide. When I was growing up, there was this colloquial saying among us young kids uh, where we said, talk to the hand, because what? The face ain't listening. Um, so that was, that was the thing. Um, and then there's also kind of a broader colloquial saying of like, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. And so there's kind of a picture of a guy up here of he's just got, he's completely closed off. This might have even been from that, uh, that sermon, ironically open. Uh, and so, but here's this guy, and even though the phrase is hear no evil, speak no evil, uh, consume no evil, have no evil be in your everything, the guy's completely stopped up. Nothing's getting past those hands right? Uh, and then, of course, there's a brick wall there, uh, and also an open highway. And one of these things is not like the other, is it? Um, I use this as just a way to kind of get our minds around uh, something that's really sad. It, it's a weird way of closing out chapter 13 and even closing out the section on parables because Jesus spoke to people in parables in order to reveal God's kingdom and for it to be exposed to everyone, those who were both willing and unwilling to receive it. He just, he cast the par parables out there for anyone and everyone to hear. Even among his disciples, he, he spoke out these parables uh, when he was alone with them and, uh, and or even explained some of the parables. And and in that place, he was casting out this teaching, this idea of the kingdom of heaven to those who are willing and unwilling to receive it. And in a similar way, we're going to see a moment in the life of Jesus where the people that you would imagine Jesus would want these people to get it the most, they're, they actually exhibit that they're unwilling to have anything to do with what Jesus has to say. And it's a weird way, I'll, I just forthright telling you, it's a weird way to end, end a series. I normally like to be all upbeat and, and everything, and that's cool, but sometimes we do need this kind of more sobering reality that just because Jesus says it, and just because we, there's this experience that is, is put out there, 
doesn't mean that everybody's going to respond the same way. In your life, just because you come to church on a Sunday morning doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to experience the same way and same impact from God as the person sitting next to you. Now, I would hope and pray that we're all open to, to receive what God has for us today. However, I'm not naive to think that just everybody gets the same thing because it really depends on how open we are to what God is doing. And this is the case for the people that are going to experience Jesus in our passage today. So without further ado, let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 53. Or if you'd like to follow along on the screen with me, you're welcome to do that too. Matthew 13, 53. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there, and coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not, or is not this the carpenter's son? Is not this Mother, or his mother called Mary, and are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, and are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? There's that phrase, all these things. And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. The first thing I see in our passage is the carrying of the word of and work of God's kingdom home. Carrying the word and work of God's kingdom home. So Jesus, he, he's just had this great tour of ministry in Capernaum. Uh, training up his disciples, his disciples were there. Uh, he's been doing all kinds of signs and wonders through just healing ministries, through uh, the feeding of great multitudes of people, and uh, saying really profound things that make people either scratch their head, get angry, or, or just wonder, or just get really jazzed about the Lord and faith in him. And so Jesus has been about speaking out the word of God to people and working for the kingdom through these, these signs and wonders type ministries. But there comes a point where he's done with all that. He's, the tour has wrapped up. Um, as they say, the, the dates have, have reached a point where it's time to go home. It's time to see his parents. It's time to see the neighbors maybe that he grew up with and the people that uh, he made tables for or, or all kinds of things because he was a carpenter's son. But he goes home, and, and that's a good thing. He finished speaking in parables to these big crowds, and that's a good thing. But then he goes home, and like a traveling rabbi would, it was a great seat of honor to be able to get up in their local gathering uh, to share the word, to both read from some Old Testament scroll and maybe give some kind of a insightful teaching about it. And the people, instead of receiving him, which we'll get to in a minute, uh, they, they really put up a wall there, so to speak. And yet, Jesus went about carrying all this experience with him back home. And this makes me think about how uh, recently Angie and I had the privilege of traveling to Alaska. It was our first time ever being to Alaska. It probably won't be the last since I have family up there and I never get up to see them. Uh, but uh, we were up there and it was a wonderful experience. But there, there were these, these moments where 
uh, because there wasn't a whole lot else to do other than the activities at this place we were, and the main event was a wedding, destination-type wedding we were going to. But there were these key moments where we went to the gift shop, and we were thinking about our kids, and we were thinking about certain other people that we were going to see when we got home, and don't be jealous if that wasn't you, but... Um, but we were going to the gift shop because what else do you do uh, when you're out in the middle of nowhere? And um, there's the gift shop, and we had opportunity to pick up souvenirs, which uh, without fail is almost always, it, it embodies something about the place that you were or some experience that you may have had. And so, uh, for example, there were tons of stickers that were in the the form of elk or moose or bears even, because why not? It's Alaska. Um, uh, There were loads of beanies and all the typical fare with souvenirs. Uh, But Angie and I, we only had so much space in our luggage uh, because you got to pay for that (laughs) coming home. And so we didn't get a ton of souvenirs, but we did get some. And this makes me think about how in our life, not that we just go from event to event to event, but that our lives are a sum total of our experiences, are they not? And that both good and bad. Uh, and, and even with the good, or, or and sometimes with the good, it's how the Lord has transformed a bad moment and turned it for good and transformed it with something he's done in our life and in ministering the gospel in a way and speaking the gospel into our lives, his good news into our lives in a way that transforms us. And then we have a testimony about that. And it makes me think of this because for Jesus, he was already perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Yet for him in his humanity, He was a sum total of his experiences up until that point. He had just been on the road, getting exhausted, um, uh, trying to to communicate to his disciples these really big concept things, and they're a bunch of knuckleheads, and so sometimes they get it and sometimes they don't. And sometimes they ask the same question, I'm imagining, but like a similar question over and over again, and because students don't always have it all together. But Jesus, when he went home, he was bringing with him the sum total of these experiences. And I imagine he had some anecdotes, some personal stories that he might have been able to tell. Or as he was explaining the word in the synagogue, and he was sharing from what the Bible has to say, that he'd be able to maybe relate it in a way that might have been different than when he had been there before. And so for you and I, we carry with us God's Word and God's work as it has impacted yours and my life. We carry that with us everywhere we go. So a question would be, are we aware of that? Jesus was intentional about everything he did. He knew that he was bringing with him something different when he came home and carried with him this authority to spread the gospel even in his own hometown, even in his local synagogue that I imagine, you know, growing up, it would be like maybe in like 10 or 15 years, uh, one of my kids coming back here and trying to preach here or something And then some of us old timers by that point uh, having to figure out, you know, are we going to listen to this kid that we saw running around yelling, screaming, punching, all the things? Are we going to listen to that kid or not? Now, I don't think Jesus hit anybody necessarily. Don't get me wrong. So don't take that illustration too far. But For you and I, there's people who know our past, and we'll get to that in a second, but they know where we've come from, and so sometimes it's hard going home, but yet the 
what we see Jesus doing is he's modeling that for us. And so even though unbelief keeps us from experiencing God's kingdom, and it, it kept people who Jesus was interacting with from experiencing God's kingdom, Jesus still went. So you can go to the next slide. Uh, the next thing I see in our passage is the weighing God's kingdom based on our history. Uh, so I'm sure you noticed that the people weren't exactly thrilled at Jesus uh, teaching them. They were astonished. But then, unlike others that we've seen through the Gospel of Matthew who, who ask a blanket question of like, where did this man, who else teaches with this kind of authority? That's not where they went, is it? They said, where did this man get his wisdom and mighty works? But then they launch into this. Is not this the carpenter's son? We knew his daddy, or so they thought. Um, is not his mother called Mary? We know Mary. I went and played bridge with Mary just the other day. We had tea. It was great. I'm being facetious. Anyway, are not his brothers these names? Are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? Jesus had a history with these people. And it was a good history, but it was a history nonetheless. Um, what's interesting, I was doing some, some reading about this passage and some of the reason why maybe they, they question so much and, and whatnot compared to when you read the rest of the Gospel of Matthew and the life of Jesus is that really Jesus was born in Bethlehem, so away from Nazareth. Uh, Nazareth was in the north, Bethlehem was in the south. Um, and uh, so the family in Nazareth um, they didn't get to be around when Jesus was born. Uh, shortly after Jesus was born, because there was a price on Jesus' head, he, he fled to Egypt, uh, and uh, Joseph and Mary and, and fam, they were all down in Egypt for a time. And so the people in Nazareth didn't see Jesus at that time, but then they come home to Nazareth at one point and settle down, and there they are growing up, so they don't know the miracle of Jesus' birth. They don't know the story necessarily of uh, what we call the incarnation, where, uh, where an immaculate conception. Uh, funny story, quick aside, in Alaska, we walked by a church that was the Church of the Immaculate Conception. It was a wonderful experience. Anyway, uh, but that, that's totally for free, has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But here we go. So, but these people in Nazareth, they didn't know that story. They just knew that here is Jesus and here's Joseph and he's, and he's, Jesus is calling Joseph daddy and that here's this family, here's this growing family in Nazareth. They only know that history. They know that Jesus apprenticed under Joseph, that he learned his father's trade, so to speak. And so it would have been astonishing for them to now hear Jesus, who would have been trained as like a blue-collar type worker, coming back and teaching with such great authority like many of the spiritual leaders in his day. It was a weird experience for them. They, could, they didn't know how to categorize it, this experience that they were having, because they were they had heard the news of what Jesus had been doing, and now they're hearing what Jesus is saying for themselves right there. And on this trip to Nazareth, they're all scratching their heads of like, oh, wait a minute. I knew, I knew you back in the day. I knew your history. I knew where you come from. That doesn't add up. What happened? And so, uh, so they were weighing this. And so that's where this picture comes from of the idea of like, okay, I, I have this evidence here. That's interesting. 
but I have this evidence over here, and this is factual information too. How do I reconcile these two experiences of Jesus before his baptism and being filled with the Holy Spirit, and now after, and uh, before he started his ministry and called his disciples, and now he's here, and how do I weigh this out? There are people in your life who weigh their experience with you of what you were like before you knew Jesus to now after you know Jesus. From before when you were a hot mess and even now where you know Jesus and maybe you're still a hot mess and you're still figuring it out, but you know Jesus and there's some kind of a difference happening in your life that is a marked difference between who you were at one point and who you are now. Now, the challenge is Jesus doesn't make any qualms about it. He's not trying to explain himself to these people. The people that have probably known him is for most of his life. And yet, what does he do? He doesn't just try to defend himself. All he does is he's communicating and he's doing what God had called him to do in that place. For you and I, as we go throughout this world, as we are impacted by God's good news, and that changes us, that transforms us from the inside out, our job isn't to help others reconcile our history with who we are now. What is our job is to be faithful to be a witness to what God has done in our life so far up until this point. Where you can, because we're not Jesus and we do have a past like this, and we can say, yeah, I was here, but now I'm here. By God's grace, I was here, now I'm here. And so let other people do the weighing. Let them get spun out and, and tripped up over all that. You just be faithful to represent the God that has met you and has impacted your life with his love and with his grace and his kindness. Because unbelief keeps us from experiencing God's kingdom. And unfortunately for the people in Nazareth, that was the wall that was up between them and this experience. Jesus brought with him that experience. He was he was well-versed in being able to help people along with that experience and ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit. But it was like talking to a brick wall because immediately, or like a fence. Ha <laughs> ha, there you go. A fence, a fence, there you go. They were offended. But because it was like, there's nothing getting past there. It was like, because of all this history, it's like their ears were like this and their eyes were like this and their mouths were like this and they were like, we don't, we don't want what you have for us because we can't understand this. We can't reconcile our experiences with you. And so then that brings us to this final point of that I see in our passage is a rejecting of the influence of God and his kingdom through unbelief. It's interesting that everywhere else, everyone's amazed, everyone's drawn closer to Jesus, but here, not so much. And so Jesus makes this staggering statement that a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And so the role of a prophet is somebody who says what, G what God has said and communicates that. That is, that is prophecy. It's not just some uh, future telling or soothsaying or, or any kind of application that way. The most basic understanding of prophecy in the Bible is that God has something to say and a prophet is that mouthpiece to deliver that to God's people. And so Jesus in that moment is claiming that role or at least that, that function in that moment to say what God is saying, to say what God would say as God even Jesus is saying, here's the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. 
as the King James would say. But they're not honoring Jesus. They're not honoring the word that he's bringing to them. They instantly flag it with questions and accusation of like, isn't this, is this not just this person? I can really discount this because it's, it, he, he made my table. He, he helped install the door in my house. Like, it's just that guy. I don't, I don't, they categorize it in that sort of way. And so they reject it. And then as Matthew describes that Jesus did not do many mighty works there. I think in the gospel of Mark, it says that Jesus could not do it because of their unbelief. And that really this, this faith or this lack thereof of faith is really, it's the hinge point of people's experience with God and his kingdom. And so it makes me think of this picture of somebody who's like, ain't no way, ain't no how, it's not happening, I'm not, I'm not listening to another word, get out of here. <laughs> um, now, for you and I, if we were to apply this to our life, I think the first application we need to be examining ourselves with is to ask, are there places in my life where I don't believe, where I don't yet trust what God says? Because if there are, then we need to speak the gospel to those places where we, whatever it is, is showing that we don't actually trust the Lord to show up and be enough for us. And so whether it's a habit or whether it's some hang-up that you have or maybe it's a past hurt that, that you don't know exactly what to do with because the pain is still there and it still just gnaws at you, that could be a place of unbelief that still just crops up in your life time and time again. And so the question is, are you going to be like the town of Nazareth of like, oh yeah, I've heard about, I know what Jesus has to say about, I've heard him before on this topic. Or are you going to open yourself up and say, okay, Lord, even if it hurts, what do you have to say? What would your gospel speak into this situation? Where am I not believing you here? And then trying to correct your theology there to where then it turns it around from that unbelief and switches it over to belief and faith. I think another place is that uh, of application would be that for you and I, in a similar way like Jesus, coming to grips with the fact that sometimes the people we would love to share this good news with, they might never get it from us. That doesn't mean that they'll never get it. It doesn't mean that it'll never get through. But sometimes we're not that instrument that gets to deliver God's word to them. And that's a really painful thing because I imagine... Jesus had a group of friends in Nazareth. And I imagine that that group of friends, maybe, that they would play soccer-type games together. I don't know what they played back then, but like that they would do activities together and they would have, you know, they would share meals together and practice Shabbat together and they would, uh, that is the Sabbath, and they would get to rest together, they'd go to the synagogue together, they would do these things together together. And what if some of those friends just didn't get it? What if some of the family members just didn't get it and really just rejected what Jesus had to say? That would be heart-wrenching. What about in your life where you found Jesus, you found the difference that he's made in your life, you've been transformed, but now there's a whole bunch of people around you, friends and family, that you want them to know. But somehow, even though you're doing your best to be faithful to represent him and the experience you've had, 
they just don't get it from you. What do you do? This is not in the passage, but this is just a practical point. At that point, you pray for them. Uh, you don't get irate at them back <laughs> uh, and kind of blow up at them and like, well, forget you, I'm, I'm out of here, blah, 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 blah. Don't go there. But kind of with a cool, calm patience like Jesus, just say, okay. This is, this is a principle of, of relationship. This makes sense. I understand that a prophet is not without honor in, in his hometown and in his own household. So, okay, I understand that that's where you're coming from. And so if that's you, be encouraged today that you share a similar dynamic as Jesus had. You get to be like your Lord in that sense, where he... He was heartbroken over those relationships and those lost opportunities. Jesus is with you even now. So be encouraged. Now, for the rest of us, I, I want to kind of put a nice bow on the bow, if you will. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And so if unbelief is keeping us from experiencing God and his kingdom, I would submit to you that as an extension, and faith is the key to experiencing God in his kingdom. But what is this thing about faith? Is it just believing like a mental ascent, like, okay, check, fact, good, good to go, I understand that? Or is this something more? A, uh, a very helpful quote to me over the years and perspective from uh, a great a uh, pastor, uh, theologian named Oswald Chambers. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, there's this quote where he says, faith is deliberate confidence in the character of God whose ways you may not understand at the time. And so in that way, faith is a whole lot like a choice where I'm going, I un, I. I see, I might have even experienced a little bit, this is what God is like, this is his character, this is what this would lead me to believe, and so I'm going to put my faith and my trust deliberately, it's on purpose, I'm going to put that confidence in his good character, even though I may not understand it. Even if I can't really wrap my brain around what I'm experiencing right now, but I know that my God is good. I know that he loves me. I know that he went to the cross to die in my place for me and for you. I know that he offers that to all of us. And I know that faith and that trust, deliberate confidence in that character of who God has revealed himself to be, that is, that's a saving faith. That's the faith that will carry you through difficult times, even rejection and, and hard hardships. So I want to encourage you that although unbelief keeps us from that experience, faith will actually lead us to experience more of God in his kingdom. And so wherever you're at today, my encouragement to you would be to put... <clears throat> your deliberate confidence in the character of God and who God is and what God is like and what God has done for you. Let's pray.